In the winter, some years, the ice is on Lake Hornborga and there are hundreds of skaters doing ice skating. Later, the, the spring comes and there are thousands of birds occupying the lake. So, my name is Thomas Herzmann. I have been working with Lake Hornborga for many years and I would like to give a kind of easy presentation about what I've done with the cranes, make them dance, what I've done with the lake to make it a bird lake, and how we have managed to create a sustainability in the landscape by doing those things. I want to start with this lady. We can call her Tilda. She came here maybe 10, 12,000 years ago. And she and her group of Stone Age people, they realized that Lake Hornborga is a good place to be. There is fish, there are birds to eat, there are wildlife around. And later when they did want to do construction, there was reed that you can make roof from. And so it was a good place. And human beings have used this ecological system of Lake Hornborga for thousands of years up to now. There was a bit break um, in the late 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s, but we take that later. And now we move to another person who also lived at Lake Hornborga, by Lake Hornborga in a way too. His name was, is Thomas. He lived 150 kilometers away from Lake Hornborg. His father and mother, they took him, put him in a car without safety belt and drove 150 kilometers up to the lake. And he experienced the crane dance. There were thousands of cranes and they were there at the lake, close to the lake, because at the big farms, Bjurum and Daxnes, they did farming potato because Swedish people needed alcohol. So the potato farming went into distillery and there was alcohol produced. That is actually why the cranes discovered Lake Hornborga. But in the, in the 70s, the distilleries was closed down and the potato fields were gone. And the cranes that were thousands before went down to 700 only. And that's when Thomas came back and realized that we need to do something to save this spectacular crane dance. It's, it's, a, it's kind of a symbol for the spring in Sweden to see this thing. So at the late 70s, early 80s, we managed to get local authorities, Swedish Environmental Protection Agency and the county administration, all of them on board on financing a system that could feed the birds, even if the potato for distillery were, were gone. So in this area here, we started to farm potatoes specifically for the cranes. So they were, all potatoes were left in the ground. And we started a small information system at the road close by. And this is how it began. We had an information central in the, in the barn, very, very primitive and basic where the two municipalities came together to manage the information to visitors. We had a nature information center. That's a caravan. So that was the kind of first steps to arrange what was developed further later. And as I maybe mentioned before, we were a bit frustrated that we were not capable of doing crane dance in or at the lake at least. But we know, we knew that we could feed the crane, we could attract them and thereby moving them. 
So we did. In 1991, we started to feed the cranes down close to the lake shore of the lake itself. And it took half a day or a day or so, and all the cranes realized that this is where the goodies are. So they started to come together with a lot of other birds. Like here you see swans and, and uh, ducks, uh, etc. They were also there together with the cranes. And when the cranes, when the crane move, the people move too. So they went to where the cranes were. And here you see this big parking place where now 150,000 people every year during the three years, three weeks where the cranes are here, they are here to enjoy the cranes. 150,000 people. And the good thing that I feel is that the landscape has managed to take care of all those visitors. People get hungry, then there's eating facilities in the neighborhood. People want a cup of coffee, and there is a coffee facilities. People get tired and want to sleep and there's accommodation facilities. So the, the society and the landscape are now taking care of the people. And the number of cranes, hmm, starting at 700 here, landing at 27,000 cranes over that in 2019. So it's a remarkable upgrading of a crane dance and it's a remarkable upgrading of the visitors coming to the lake. So that is a story of how we could manage to move the cranes and make it more popular at the lake. The lake then, but that's the next issue. Tilda, the Stone Age lady, she was here 10 or 12,000 years ago, and it's been a lake since then. However, there were also um, agriculture engineers here, and they decided that let's drain the lake and make it arable land. And they had a dream, and they started to build channels to get the water out of the lake area as fast as possible. And the nature reacted, and of the lake that was big once, there were only those small blue dots of open water left, a couple of hectares each. The purple color is reed, monotonous reed, and the former wet meadows around the lake, they were now turned into arable land. In the 60s, this man, Pio Swanberg, Together with the professor in limnology, Sven Björk, they started to have a vision. We need to restore the lake to make it again a bird lake. So I want to give a bit of honor to those people who were the pioneers. Even if we didn't do exactly what they wanted, we did a lot of what they were aiming at. So. In the 70s, these people, Pio Svanberg and Björk and the team around them, they presented an idea. They said they should take away the reed where there is blue color on the map, and they should raise the water with one and a half meter, which is very much in a shallow lake. And to do that, they had to build embankments to protect the arable land. So the vision became uh, a rather deep water surrounded by embankments. And that was a bit questions in the er questioned in the early 80s. And that's when me and my colleague Torsten Larsson from Swedish EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, we were given the task to try to define a bit better what you want. So we started with saying that we cannot create a bird lake that covers all kind of different birds. We have to give priority. So we gave priority to ducks and waders. Ducks out in the water, they need 
submerged vegetation, underwater vegetation. To get that into the lake, we need a water depth, of course, but not too much water, because then there will be no underwater vegetation. So we said, not one and a half meter, but maybe 85 centimeters. We wanted, for the waders especially, we wanted the shore meadows, the, the wet meadows that are flooded in the spring, etc. And to get that, we cannot have embankments around the whole lake. So no embankments. And finally, we wanted, we had a criteria of saying we, we want a lake that will sustain. We don't want a lake that suddenly becomes good and then it goes bad again. So we wanted to create a lake with varied water level, high flood in the spring, low water in summer, and this water level should vary between years. And the restoration was a bit spectacular, to say the least, and very much questioned. But what we did physically in the lake is summarized in this map. The reed, 1,200 hectares, was to be taken away. I come back to how we did that. The orange area of forests and bush land had to be cleaned up, not only cut down, but cleaned up. These channels out in the lake, they had to be leveled out in order to make the water circulate in the whole water basin. And we built a dam on the west side with a sluice that could regulate the water level. The reed, we start with that, because that was also a very um, spectacular part. The beginning, reed, monotonous reed, with half a meter, one meter layer of dead reed in the bottom. In order to do the killing of the road system, a rotivation of the road system, we had to take away a lot of the standing reed, and we managed to find out the ways how to burn the standing reed. So that we did first, and then came the rotivation. And in the spring flood that come next year, we could see that the all this chopped road system, it was transferred up to the shore to the high water level. It was taken out of the water, of the basin, so to say. And very rapidly, we saw how the submerged vegetation moved in and took the place of the reed. So that was rather successful, or very successful. But working in wetlands with strong, heavy machines, well, then you have to be a bit specialized. So in the, in the work that we carried out, we was also how to develop a machine that could do the job. And this is uh, Sega. Sega was a Danish company who had this specialization of making very soft tires. So this machine could cross the open water, could run through muddy uh, um, parts of the lake and into the vegetation and it has never got stuck so far. And behind it, we had different applications for, for shopping, the shopping the road systems or just shopping over ground vegetation. And this machine was, after the restoration of Lake Holmborga, it was used in a, in a number of other lakes in Sweden and actually also in Latvia. Yeah. When you change a system, there will always be people who are critical to what you're doing. And those who were critical, like landowners, ornithologists, fishermen, uh, hydropower people, etc., they were very active and they reached out through the media. And we considered it, with modern words, to be fake news, of course. So we decided we need our channel of information and therefore we wanted to build a spectacular house where people could come 
and get the information from us about the restoration. And we managed to get that done through, again, through cooperation, local municipalities, Swedish Environmental Protection Agency, road authorities, all contributed to the cost to make this uh, rather famous nature information center, where people were also given a direct contact with the lake outside the house. So people were attracted to start walking along the, the tracks outside to experience some of the rich fauna in a lake. And this place has been further developed the last 10 years or 10, 20 years. And today the people who are managing it are doing a fantastic job. Every year they have a variety of activities covering bats, insects, flowers, trees, fruit trees, geology, you name it. So if you manage to come to Lake Hornborg, yeah, this is a place you should go to and you will see the website by the end of this presentation where you can find further information. But they are doing a fantastic job. A couple of pictures showing the change of the landscape. And here you see again this information center at Fogelöden on the east side. Fogelöden is a peninsula that goes all the way out. These blue areas here are the result of the early trials to get away with the reed. So if it was a picture from before the restoration, it should actually be green, totally green with reed. So what we did here was to cut down the forest, cut down the bushes, and we get the open grazed, you see the cows maybe here, um, a grazed landscape and out in the water there was no reed but there was submerged vegetation. Another picture showing a similar development. This is Seatuna in the east, southeast. You see a lot of fields, small fields where there were agricultural activities going on in the 80s. You see big areas of forests, of bushes, and you see the yellow reed. And this is what it looks like now. The yellow reed is replaced by the blue shallow water. The big bush and wood areas is replaced by wet meadows, shore meadows that are either grazed by cattle or harvested for hay purposes. When you create the bird lake, I think you have to realize that you cannot make all birds come together in the same pond. In the same way as you cannot have all human beings in the same pond either. I mean, people working with hydropower, they want one thing. People working with agriculture, they want another thing. Ornithologists, they want something. Fishermen want something, etc. Same goes for the birds. This is a March Harrier. And sadly to say, this is a bird that has gone out, especially during the last 20 years. So the first 10 years of the restoration, they were quite active. Um, but we don't have the big monotonous reed, which this bird loved to have as a, as a nesting area. There have come in other birds of prey, but maybe not replacing this one. So sadly, this is gone. This is a, a crowned crane, horned, horned crane, sorry, horned grebe, horned grebe. And the grebes have also developed in a very nice way. Um, the biggest increase is on the great crested grebe. Um, they have found the food and they have found the nesting opportunities. Maybe the last years the nesting opportunities has gone down 
as the remaining reed has been, been pressed backwards, so to say. But still, in Lake Hornborgia, we can see all five species of Scandinavian grebes. And the bird lake has one function in the spring, another during the nesting season, another during the summer season, and yet another one during the autumn migration. These are vigeons flying in over Lake Hornborgia. There's one mallard too, but vigeons. And the role of the lake for the migrating birds in the autumn is actually one of the things that have impressed most on me. Because the number has gone up dramatically, you could say. From under 5,000 to up to almost 60,000. And, and this is where we now see it's fluctuating between the years. So this is one of the very, very positive outcomes of the restoration. I mentioned submerged vegetation. You don't see it. When you stand in a bird watching towers, you don't see any submerged vegetation. But in the 1,200 hectares that we managed to take away the reed, submerged vegetation rather instantly occupied like 90%. And that is an important species, both for the birds to feed from, but also in a balance within the lake. So you don't get the plankton production, you get the submerged vegetation production. And on this submerged vegetation, you also see this. This is a gamarus. I'm not sure about the English name, but it's a, it's a small, small crayfish, one centimeter big or so. And it's a, it's a very important species for, for, for some of the bird species. Coming back a little bit to the birds, as it is a bird lake. Um, the total list of birds seen in Lake Hornborgia has gone up from 250 to almost 300 during the years of the restoration. Each year, almost 220 species, different species are seen at the lake. And this is, of course, partly a product of the restoration itself. But I would also say that it's partly a product of the eager ornithologists that are running, for example, a field station at the lake. They are getting more and more professional and they are seeing more and more birds. So the restoration itself, together with the good bird watchers, have meant that these figures are very high. This is the most art uh, species rich wetland in inland Sweden. At least we made one mistake. Maybe we made two. I don't know. But one mistake was this one. It's a water engineer construction that we built with sluices, etc., that could regulate the water level. And thereby there was a migration barrier constructed. So fish, insects, and whatever life there is in the river could only reach up to this these dam construction. So what we did was this year, actually we have created something that we called, called the Hohenborger stream. A natural meandering stream where insects and fish could migrate through. And maybe the common kingfisher is coming here to nest uh, one of the coming years, who knows? Now I'll take you back to the almost the first picture, Tilda. For me, Tilda is a symbol of sustainability, as I said. And my impression whenever I'm, I come to the lake now is that we have reached, we have managed to create a sustainable bird lake. And the greatest experience almost for me is to see 
how well all actors are acting to keep the value of the lake up on a level that was created by the restoration. So there are a number of groups, visit Lake Holmborgia, Holmborgia Field Station, etc., etc. They are all embedding the lake in a concern that make me feel that this is a sustainability now. But to do that, we needed to have a teamwork. I have been standing here now talking, so you could have an impression that I did it, but I was part of the team. And there have been many, many people engaged, contributing their special expertise and thereby creating the sustainable lake. So that was my words about the crane dance and the bird lake. And I thank you for listening. And if you have any quiz questions, you are of course free to connect to me over my email. And I warmly recommend that you enter the website of the lake itself, which is down here. That is a very good source of information. So I say thank you very much for listening in.